computador aqui no meu móvel. Está bem, está bem. Dois minutos, está bem, está bem. Excuse me, we are waiting for the computer. He will open and to support me because in my age, the matter of computers are very complicated. <laughs> to, to be frank with you. Okay, I, I will speak slowly before all the con technical conditions are preparing. First of all, thank you very much to those who were yesterday and repeat today. It's a good indicator for, <laughs> for me. Thank you. It means that you have another ideas that you would like to discuss with me today. It is fine. Uh, really, today I, I will make a comparison between the Soviet uh, psychologist perception of Marxism and Holzkamp reception. As I said you uh, yesterday, my departure, the departure point is not Holzkamp at all. It was the Soviet Union when I uh, did my two doctoral degrees, doctor in psychology, doctor in sciences. And even I owe Athanasius Marbakis, who is here, my and my friend, to really create interest to Holzkamp. Holzkamp is not well known a psychologist in Latin America. I don't know even one group working on the Holzkamp influence. And uh, when Athanasius provoked me after discussion, and he has sent many materials to me about Holzkamp, I really interest in, in his work and in his figure. And even a uh, Athanasius is editor of one of the future number of annual review of critical psychologies, psychology uh, devoted to Holzkamp, all the papers, and participated psychologists from all over the world. And precisely in that number, I have a dialogue about subjectivity with the Holzkamp's position. Then, today I will try to, to, to make uh, some difference and, and some proximities between the appropriation of Marxism by Soviet psychology and by Holzkamp. First of all, I will, before all, I would like to say that one point I like so much in Holzkamp is the original character of his work. He was influenced by Marxism, but was critic of the Marxism. He was influenced in one moment of his work, a little later, uh, on phen uh, phenomenology. But uh, the way he approached it to phenomenology, it has been very interesting and curious for me, because it's the same representation that I have of any philosophy. Philosophy is an animal of seven heads. And it depends from which head or from which angle you are capable to enter in order to establish a dialogue with the philosopher. And uh, the Soviet psychology, the approach to Marxism, Holzkamp uses used Marxism as a device of new theoretical position. He really aims to create a new psychological system. It is another point that it is very important for me. He sees psychology in terms of system. But anyway, as I said yesterday, he cannot overcome the uh, fragmentation of functions. He talked about subjectivity, about, about emotions, about think, thinking, about imagination, but cannot integrate, assemble all these concepts in new qualitative labels of unit or of psychological concepts. I want to, to follow the order I seen my, to my exposition, but from my point of view, there was a very promissory concept uh, in Holzkamp 
that maybe he has not time, as Pigoski has not time to develop, for example, the concepts of Pirishivanian sense in the last moment of his work, that is the concept of conduct of everyday life. Is the last point of my presentation. I will do my presentation around 50 minutes, one hour, I don't know. And after that, we'll be in the discussion. You can comment, polemize with me, or answer, ask me whatever you, you want to ask. OK. First, in the relation of the appropriation of Marxism, it was very interesting to see a leftist person, a critical person, in the 60s to express in this way about a, a Marx. Oh. oh, no, no, it's not this one. Oh. No, the first one. This is the first. Mm -hmm. This is the first. Es la primera. Mm -hmm. eh, no, this no, no. Eh, 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 vea la primera. Okay. Ah, yes. It's the same. Here, here. This is a subjective experience. I, I am old, but not crazy. <laughs> As you can see he, here, it's a uh, it's really very interesting critic because philosoph philosophers, most of them, speak of everything, but there are uh, more stressing cores in the thinking of any philosopher. And of course, the core of Marx was what Holkans specified here. In the 60s, practically no one from the leftist uh, position was capable to express so free in relation to the limitation that he perceived in the Marxist position. What's interesting, because in that time, Holkans was informed not only from Marxism, but from Soviet psychology, too. And uh, I am not doubt that uh, the attempt to rescue the individual as important for discussing the social processes is one of the important, the more important achievements of Holzkamp. Yep. Even after... I have one uh, didactical point. Um, it would be helpful to um, have time to read the quote. Oh, and excuse me. Now we read it together. I can read if you uh, want. Yeah, yeah, yes? that, would, that would be helpful because. No, I, probably I, not all. Excuse me. All right. Let, let, I, do you know what is the problem? That, in my experience, when I'm part of the public, I feel very bad when the people read what is there, because I read with my eyes and I process with my mind. And, but no problem at all. Any of us have different ways of processing. No problem at all. So we read it. Okay. Read, read. You read better so, than as me. As many futile attempts, the author refers to the attempts to advance on human nature departing from Marxism, have shown. Progress in this direction cannot be made by starting with the Marxist anatomy of bourgeois society and expecting to arrive at a, at a conception of the individual from the, dis the, the dissection and the specification of the mode of production in particular capitalistic societies. No matter how precise and detailed such analysis may be, the individuals as such remain somehow out of, the, of reach. Okay, you have proposed a good didactic and we will follow in the rest of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, and it is very interesting that uh, before, excuse me, after that time, pass to the second one, it, it was Davidov, one of the more important uh, followers of Leontief positions in one moment of his work. Davidos said, at the time, A.N. Leontief, with his group of Karko collaborators, did not follow Vygotsky's orientation toward the study of the structure of consciousness and did not recognize the developmental functions of emotions, but remained in a position to study the genesis and development of consciousness in practical activity in terms of research on the structure of their own activity. Yes. It is very important because uh, in that moment, Davidov refers to one of the more problematic issues in Soviet psychology. The fact to... Uh, 
give a realistic, very realistic uh, conception of activity as process. Unlike Rubinstein, that was not dominant in that period because it was writing in 1996, uh, the official psychology that, that was exactly activity theory really was oriented, was uh, even was named basic activity uh, theory. Why? Because was the relationship with action with external objects, but consciousness not participated was a result and a phenomenon of external operation with objects. It was completely different from the Rubinstein position that the principle of the unity between consciousness and activity, what it means. It means any human action is at the same time an organization of consciousness in the actions. Consciousness was in movement, was not an internal entity, you know, and it was also the Vygotsky position in the last stage of his theory. Anyway, here David touched a problem that continued to be a problem, in my, in my view, in Holzkamp theory. The matter of considering function of emotion as a, a, a essential generative process of human development. Uh, one of the problems that was Soviet psychology in the assimilation of Marxism was the representation that higher psychological cognitive functions were a reflection of external world. But it's not so easy to explain how, what is the genesis of emotions, because emotion cannot be a reflection. Emotion has a gener generative power that it is impossible to explain as a reflection of something external. Then, and it was essentially the work of Ottenkar, Ute, Ottenkar, the Ottenkar, Ostrakan. Ostrakan. <laughs> it's difficult to my, in, at my age to get, it, my phonetic in English is back in my imagine. Uh, but as I said yesterday, my English is my third language. My second one is Russian. I belong to the generation of Cuban to, who studied in Russian and who speak Russian. And when we perceive, we have to get again to advance on English because if not, it would be very difficult to enter in the international arena. But uh, on to, uh, yesterday, um, the, the day before yesterday, I discussed that one of the topics that I don't convince me and in which I find a very close similarity between Holzkamp and Leontief is the way uh, Ute represented herself that emotion resulted from two kinds of uh, a double structure of emotion, or of needs. The, one vital sens sensual needs and other productive needs. I say that for me it's an oversimplification of one of the more complex problems of human psychology is the matter of motivation. Yesterday I offered my own position on respect of this problem. Today we can discuss also extended in the discussion. But uh, the concept of need, it seems as need will define, will determine the motivated behavior. And uh, when I listened in the first day that I was not a, the, the, the person who was talking that sexuality belonged to the first kind of need I got impressed because uh, human motivation cannot be represented through static concepts. In, for example, in sexuality, are integrated sexual human sexuality is integrated by what I say I define as subjective senses, are flashes, snapshots of symbolic emotional integration through which the cosmos of one individual experience organized in different ways in each human behavior. It means that around or integrating uh, sexuality are ensemble 
the matter of race, the matter of moral, religion, the way in which I was or not educated in relation to my body, to express my body, and many, many different facts that precisely define why sexuality is a cultural production in, in human beings, and not only an, a biological impulse. Uh, I will discuss this uh, after my, my next explanation. No. Ve adelante, ve adelante, Dani. Me parece que tiene que haber otras adelante. Mira, a ver. ¿No hay otras adelante? Ah, yes. This is the contribution of one, one of the followers of critical psychology, ¿no? At this you send me as uh, important game. <laughs> okay, this is provided type, type of team. We shall Yes, positive, sí. <laughs> There is the providing type of needs, which according to the new spe species, spe specific activity are referred to as productive needs by CP and motivate to perform all activities causing preventive effects. A short later, the author continued, it is only the double structure that is unmodifiable, but it is an open structure, open to manifold variations of objects being connected with it. Before its first satisfaction, the, needs, the, the need does not know its object. The object still has to be detected, as the Russian psychologist Alexei Leontiev puts it. Yes, it's a confirmation in one of the closer followers of uh, Holstein, uh, of Holstein's position, not of Holstein's person, that the proximity between him, his uh, and Leontiev on the matter of human needs, needs and the fundamental concept for explaining human motivation. Of course, is in, in my in my opinion, paradoxically, Holzkan entered in a zone of comfort to explain the human needs, because to say that higher human characteristic needs are productive needs, needs are really a very narrow representation of the complex motivation that uh, we, each of us, has in different moments of our life. Uh, another important difference, this is one similar point between uh, Holzkamp, I, I seen that as it happened with American psychologists, Holzkamp discovered Soviet psychology through Leontiev. It happened also in Latin America. It happened in American psychologists because when Brunner and Michael Cole and the founders of what is given called cultural historical activity theory, that it is for me a neologism, it was a moment in which Leon Tief and his group had a very high political power. Then. Most of the translation to other language from the Soviet psychology were related to this group. And it's possible that Holkan discovered Leon Tief and as a Marxist psychology, because we cannot avoid to see that in that in that time Soviet psychology was seen as the maybe the top expression of the Marxism application in psychology. Application no, the Marxism uh, principles, the application of Marxist principles in psychology. However, in other points. There are a big difference between Holzkamp and Soviet psychology. With the exception of Vygotsky and Rubinstein, Soviet psychology only refers to Marx, Engel, Lenin, and Stalin in the period of Stalin. And Holzkamp has a very open dialogue with different philosophical positions, even with Freud. Very creative dialogue with Freud, very interesting, and the way in which he approached it to the matter of, uh, of um, phenomenology, as I say in, in the beginning of my, of my lecture, was for me very impressive also in that time, without any prejudice 
recognized that there are many different positions in phenomenology and stressed what he was looking for in phenomenology. That really, it was related to one big challenge that any critical psychology or cultural historical psychology keeps even to this moment. The epistemological methodological challenge to study complex systems of Holzkamp attempted to, to, to found with the concept of subjectivity. The other big difference was related to this. Epistemological discussion never existed in Soviet Union because epistemology is a very delicate field from ideological point of view. What is the relation, the relation between reality and knowledge? This is a reflection. It is not necessary epistemology because it's the same thing. For example, there is one statement, one Vygotsky statement, very, very famous, that I completely rejected, that any internal properly psychical operation first was a social operation. That it means that human psyche have not any, any kind of generative character. It's simple a reproduction of something given externally uh, to the human beings. Uh, as I think, and I say this different moments, in the conversation, informal conversation in these days, sometimes it seems to me that many of the young people here saw that the only critical psychology that has been developed in the history of psychology was Holzkamp. And it is not real. It is because I will speak today in the afternoon about the critical psychological movement in Latin America. And also, we can like or agree or disagree, there are other critical positions uh, even in Europe, for example, from, from psychoanalysis, Stephen Frosch or Anthony Elliott have a very critical position, keeping the, themselves within psychoanalysis. It means the, the achievement of Holcan was to create a, an own theoretical uh, path for developing a critical psychology. But there exist different ways to be critical inside uh, psychology. And uh, even when Holzkamp attempted to, or appeal, uh, appealing to phenomenology for transcending even his moment as experimentalist psychologist, really, in my opinion, he keep in relation to methodology, a very inductive, descriptive position. No matter that he establishes two kinds of analysis, uh, uh, how he, he defined that, phenomenology, phenomenological analysis and um, a structural analysis, that he, he refers structural analysis as being a reconstruction. In fact, the way in which he worked on the information is more a descriptive, inductive wave of categorical analysis. I cannot perceive the contemplative process of how the knowledge has to be an hypothetical construction while is getting more elements to a some theoretical statement. It is one important epistemological point why? Because, in my opinion, theories are always hypothetical path of intelligibility. And it, it is part of the historical character of theories. We cannot aspire to get reality. We aspire to generate intelligibility to some theoretical definition that it is possible to, found, to find in different kinds of reality. For example, on the basis of our theories, we change our practice, we change our way to research, and we change our representation of the world. It is interesting because even the psychoanalytic, the psychoanalytic 
for example, as um, I really fancy, Guattari of Deleuze referred to Freud as the invention of Freud. And Merleau Ponty, that was quoted by Holtz, can say, design is a human fiction, but is the best of the fiction. The best scientific position is that that can accompany reality in created new figures for new practices and new representation of human world. Is, this is my opinion of what theories are. And uh, I, I think that Holzken still uh, keep a position to grasp elements that are in reality. Of course, theories are in reality, but not in the same, in the same terms of the theory. When one theory functions, it means that you are touching, you are entering contact with important facts of reality that you develop the capacity to follow in your research world and in your practical position. I am not um, relativistic as the social constructionism, for being the knowledge is not the consensus of the institution of person. Knowledge is, le is valid, is legitimate, when, when one theory functions in order to advance new problems of the reality I am living and in order to develop new ways of research and of practice. In, in that point, uh, for example here, it's very interesting because uh, Ute Hosterkamp Ute Hoster, Hoster, said, in more recent times, the problem of cognition is here, man. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I don't read that. <laughs> read you that you, you, your English in the Manchester is. <laughs> in more recent times, the problem of cognition guiding functions of emotions has only been treated, so far as I can see, by Soviet psychologists, not by employing introspective descriptive methods, but by controlled experimental observations. Yes, it is a um, very true observation of the Osterkamp. It was interesting because Soviet psychology, with some exception, as it was Lydia Ilinich Nabochovich, was a positivistic psychology from a methodological point of view. And the mainly positivistic was Leontief, that all the research of Leontief were on the higher psychological function from the experimental, but the positivistic experimentation, because there exist other ways to approach to the matter of experimental psychology. But the point that I also want to refer in this quotation is that he used the term, the term introspective descriptive methods. And here it's possible to observe the influence of a phenomenology, because phenomenology based it, based it on the narrative of the other related one particular experience. The object of phenomenology is human experience. It is not the human psychological system. And even it's interesting how Holtz can creatively, in that book that you gave me yesterday, he went to overcome this trap, no? Hmm? Trump, trap. Trap. This trap. And he said, the phenomenological analysis stop in the study of experience, but the reconstructive categorical analysis oriented to psychological organization of processes. The, put, the, the point is that I really did not perceive in the examples given by Holstein that he used a reconstructive methodology. And he keep in this level that Ute declared in the inductive, descriptive uh, method, introspective. The, the, the introspection, in my opinion, one of the problems that we have for psychology is that we have not found which are the best concepts to express that we have 
to follow the complex expression of the other, and at the same time, we are part of the otherness because we are human being. I am human being like you. You are talking with me, and it is impossible for me, a researcher, eh, do, 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 do not generate, do not generate new ideas in relation of what you are saying me. But how to, to construct this in order that I can study your subjectivity, the, the way in which what you are presenting me is subjectively configured. It's a big challenge, but the only way to transcend or to advance on this challenge is really to find a way to produce hypothetical meanings through the course of the expression of the others, even through the logical device or through different kind of instruments. Because, for example, if I say you, please say me, which are your more happy, happy experiences and you, you bad ones, you have to organize the description on how do you experience the world in different moments of your life, and you are giving a lot of information for me, but not by direct, intentional way. We have to use in the research indirect ways. And it is interesting because Vygotsky, advancing of this in psychology, in the psychology of art, but never again touched on this point. Then, it is important, this uh, difference between Horskan actively attempting to create new methodological paths for a new theoretical problem and the passive character of Soviet psychology that never discussed explicitly epistemological questions of psychology. No hay ninguna antes, ¿no, Dani? No. Está bien. Ah, ok. okay. <laughs> As our functional historical analysis of the emergency and differentiation of emotionality in the general life process has revealed emotion functions as an evaluation of the environmental conditions as they are apprehended cognitively. Yes, it's a very questionable statement because I guess that the more important function of emotion is the subjective development. It's emotion are intrinsic to all the functions, psychological, I prefer to use subjective function, that add, are involved in our development. So emotion has a generative character. Emotion are not simple a question of evaluation of the environmental condition. It, it uh, reminds me so much the cognitive position in the study of emotions of Susan Foreman, Lazarus, and it one of the points in which I take a difference in relation to Holzkamp's position. I perceive a certain cognitivism and orientation to the control in the position of Holkans. And I think that, uh, of course, we are very active, uh, we are consciously active in our relationship with the world, in our action, but conscious does not control all the emotional state that emerge during the course of our actions. It is... Uh, no, I have one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. In the generalized mode of action, potence, emotion is seen for what it is. It becomes intersubjective emotional engagement. Attention is then directed at correcting the offending circumstances and increasing, rather than decreasing, the individual's control over the conditions relevant to need satisfaction. Emotion becomes an ally rather than an enemy. <laughs> 
uh, is, for example, the, the, the expression need satisfaction is, uh, for me, very obsolete. It's uh, Charles Tolman, that is uh, a current person, uh, a very strong scientific that who follow a whole composition. But uh, this is the, the, one of the problems of talking in terms of need, satisfaction or not satisfaction. Even when Ute developed the position that productive needs are not a center of satisfaction, that they generate continuously new tension. And it was said by Bolshevich in 1961, in 1961, because similarly, Dan Holsken, Soviet psychology tried to find a need the basis of human motivation. And we have to establish a radical difference between needs of corporeal state that excited our emotion in order to uh, find a balance in the relationship with relationship with our environment or need of the basis of human higher uh, human higher motivated production. For example, I remember when Garcia Marquez was Garcia Marquez was asked, oh, you have to be very satisfied by your new book. And he said, no, I'm very, I feel in discomfort. I was very satisfied when I was writing the book. This is completely different position. Satisfaction does not rule human motivation. On the contrary, one excellent example is love. You are in love and you are continuing to fantasy, to elaborate, to write in a paragraph, to, to send, to prepare a surprise for your loving partner. And love finish, finish. No gratification, no tension. Because to separate gratification and non-gratification is very mechanical way to represent human processes. You satisfy yourself, but at the same time, you have tensions. It's impossible to separate gratification from non-gratification. You know, you, you have things, for example, jealous, competitive, 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 and you are, you are good friend, is strong, and one day your partner say you, oh, you are very, very weak. Uh, you have to learn of Fulano that is a, a very physical a sport figure, and you maybe you begin to make exercise, and it's another way to be motivated. And one human motivation unfold in many different ways in complex units that I cannot repeat my presentation of yesterday, but it would be possible to repeat if some of you ask it me. Subjective configuration that move in action. Human motivation is in process, it not before the process, you know? And then, what is the motivation of thinking? To think, because thinking is a motivated operation, maybe, not motivated, but when I am writing on psychology, I concentrate myself in such a way that sometimes I don't, don't feel tiredness, angry, nothing at all. I am completely concentrated in that. Then uh, I, I guess that some of the point on which we can advance in critical psychology, I consider myself a critical psychology, not that Hoster can, uh, can, Hoster can critical, but in a very good dialogue with, with them. Uh, Atanasio knows this by my, my paper that was approved, fortunately, and by Theo Thomas, not, but Thomas Theo, not but anyone. <laughs> uh, finally, I want now to, yes, to put myself, oh, yes. Finally, I come to the point, uh, I think that this point has been relatively a little uh, developed by Holzkamp followers, maybe because it was one of the last concepts of Holzkamp that even he had not time to advance the concept and to assemble the concept within 
all his theoretical apparatus, the concept of everyday life. Students' learning activities may be linked to how they conduct their lives on a daily basis. I could connect this with certain chains of observations that I was able to make of what one might call full-fledged academic workers at university. Their academic work, too, can, as I began to see, only be ad adequately understood if one assumes that, in doing it, they always, in some way, have to reconcile its demands in other areas of their lives. Fantastic. It's practically a summary, an abstract of what I said before from myself. He, how many of you have read this chapter of this book or the original uh, Holstein uh, writing about the concept of everyday life? Yes, I recommend it to read because uh, it's interesting how the authors are more interesting in the last ideas that are not completely ended that in the corpus that take place and to which they refer commonly as his own theory. He is a, it is a very promissory concept and Holstein related some experiences as professor of the university and he said, I perceive that it is impossible that a student follow me in the classroom if I do not consider which are his problem in the daily life the daily uh, life day. I, I even put an example. If one student is in love and broke down with her partner, it is logic that in the other day it was impossible for him. The students brought to the classroom the the life of them. And it is also a very interesting concept in order to broaden the concept of what sociality is. And it's a bit different with Soviet psychology through this concept because even when, when Orstein traditionally refers to societal elements, is a distance in the way that most of Soviet psychology treated the matter of the society as social environment, as external influence. Uh, one exception in that was Rubinstein, but as I said yesterday, the matter of the symbolical social constructions, but not at all in, in the focus of attention of Soviet psychology. But here, Holstein made a presentation of the everyday life at the present moment in which we enter in contact to each other in one concrete activity. And that this activity is important to come to some conclusions, theoretical conclu conclusions, about the social processes. So social is not something stagnant outside of me. Social are the processes I am living through my subjective organization. That is very interesting point. And, uh, for example, in this book that it is relative recent from uh, 2016, there are two very important chapters. One from Wally Dreyer and another one from Thomas Theo. It's really a book that op opened new lives about the future of critical Wolfgang psychology. Finalizing, I think that there are big differences. It is impossible to identify Soviet psychology with Holzkans. They have point of commons of com in common what the main difficulty that I perceive in uh, this, the, the similar points between uh, Holstein and Soviet psychology is precisely the matter of human motivation. The concept of everyday life opened completely a new way to advance on human motivation because need is out of the scene in this uh, Holstein writing. And the others, for example, I don't remember exactly the words, 
what Ole Dreyer uh, stated in his chapter. This holds can concept open new paths for advancing of the concept of subjectivity in Holzkamp and for advancing related to this concept, the representation of social uh, life. Is, I think that any theory is incomplete because theories are the living process of thinking of authors. You know, and when the author disappears, I am completely sure that Isolkan will be still alive, or we will surprise with the change in relation to his work. And as I always like to say to dogmatic psychoanalytic, if Freud will life again, will be alive again, and you ask it, oh master, we want to invite you to the university to give a conference, he as intelligent person will say, please give me three or six months in order to read what has been writing after my death. And then when he will speak in his conference, the first that will be surprised with the dogmatic psychoanalytics. Okay, thank you so much. And then I open. <laughs> I open for comments, everything that you want. I want that you feel in confidence because this is a dialogue. Some of you are all, all known friends from yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> all of friends from yesterday. And I would like that you feel comfortable for saying whatever you want to say. This is the first question. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would like to ask, um, you've been talking a lot about 